Welcome to all of you. Oh, uh, others have joined us. Hey, John, good to see you. And, uh, and there's a group of four uh, in the den. Um, it, what we're doing, for those of you who were not with us last week, we're, we're doing four parts through the Petrine letters. And last week, I, I trim, uh, tried simply to set the background of Peter. And I did it by using a rubric out of Walter Brueggemann and the way he reads the Psalms. He talks about orientation, disorientation, and reorientation as categories for the Psalms. The orientation Psalms, God's on his throne and all is right with the world. The disorientation Psalms, oops, uh, Israel has an enemy at its border or there's turmoil in the king's house, whatever. And then reorientation, a faithful God gets the nation or the king uh, through the crisis, and now you're reoriented, hopefully with faith stronger. I think Peter went through that in his own life. Um, we looked at Peter's high point moments, early call to discipleship, one of the inner three, preaches on Pentecost, one of the pillars of the Jerusalem church, and yet notorious for being the one who denies Jesus not once or twice, but three times, even after uh, Pentecost. Galatians uh, 2 says, I had to rebuke him because he acting hypocritically with regard to the Gentiles um, uh, when he came down to help Galatia. And uh, so Peter was a person of orientation, strong, early, committed faith, and yet he got disoriented with personal failures, and the Lord reoriented him after the resurrection. Uh, the women told him, Jesus wants to meet with all of you, but Peter in particular, he says, here's to show up and, and says, okay, Peter, I'm not through with you. Uh, you still love me. Go feed my lambs. Well, we're going to look at two of the ways that Peter uh, fed the lambs, of course, he did missionary tours just like Paul did. We don't have them documented like Paul's. Um, carried his wife with him uh, as he was traveling and, and doing mission work. But what we do know is the, the two pieces of literature that we have that bear his name, 1st, 2nd Peter. 1st Peter is the one we're going to look at tonight and next Wednesday. And then we'll get into 2nd Peter uh, on the final night. So here's what, here's what we do tonight. What's the setting for First Peter? And in particular, tonight, if I were to title what we're going to do, I would call it the narrative of suffering that is laid out in First Peter. First Peter is about suffering. Uh, Peter writes from Rome. Um, in chapter five, he calls it Babylon, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as to why he calls it Babylon. John does too over in Revelation. Um, but let's just do the setting for First Peter and what calls it forth. Um, by the way, anytime you want to jump in, anytime you want to ask a question, make a comment, just unmute and say, uh, hey, Rubel, or you know, wave your hand, something, get my attention. I'll catch, I'll catch you out of the corner of my eye and, and question or comment's always good. Let's go back and do a little bit of the history of Rome because the persecution that uh, Peter is talking about and that he's trying to brace his readers for in First Peter is a persecution that is triggered in and around the city of Rome in the mid 60s. Now, our very best information is that both Paul and Peter died under the persecution that we're about to talk about in Rome in the mid 60s, probably around 65, no later than 66, 64, 5, 6. And the circumstances of that will, will I'm setting the stage to, to explain. And throughout First Peter, he talks about suffering and, and persecution. But, and this is a disclaimer, this is not an imperial persecution. It's not a formal empire-wide persecution. That doesn't start um, from the Roman Empire toward the church 
until over in the third Christian century. Any of the persecutions that, that we read about in the New Testament, including uh, the book of Revelation, where John is in exile on Patmos, is not yet a systematic empire-wide official persecution. It's headed up by um, a particular emperor who has a bone to pick with Christians, and it's probably more intense in the capital city itself, Rome itself, than anywhere else. That's certainly the case with First Peter. And maybe out in the provinces, if there is a procurator, a governor, a prefect, who's trying to kiss up to the emperor for some particular purpose. And if he sees that uh, uh, the, the emperor is unhappy with the Christians and, and he's hanging some of them out to dry, crucifying them in Rome, he may kill a few of them down in his territory too and send word in. But first Peter, here's the way, here's the way I want us to start. A little bit of Roman history. The first emperor of Rome is, of course, Caesar Augustus. He is uh, the emperor when Jesus is born. He's the one who sends out the edict that all the world is to be enrolled in a census and that for the sake of putting together a, a better taxation system. Um, Augustus is the emperor from 27 BC all the way down to 14 AD. So pretty long period of time. And following him, his son, Tiberius, is the emperor from 14 to 37. Now, if you follow the dates, 27 BC to, to uh, 37 AD, everything that is the life of Christ and the establishment of the church and the first several years of the church, the conversion of Paul and so on, takes place under those two Roman emperors. Augustus, the one who sends out the edict that causes Joseph and Mary to have to go from Bethlehem to Nazareth. Jesus is born there. Okay, that's Caesar Augustus. All of that happens under his reign. Then Claudius, I mean, I'm sorry, Tiberius, his son, is the emperor after him. He's the emperor when the church is established, uh, AD 30 and, and the uh, conversion of Paul, and so on. Then we get to a couple other emperors that don't really make it into the New Testament, Caligula and Claudius. Caligula. Um, any of you see the PBS series on Caligula? Um, uh, uh, Caligula from 37 to 41. And then an older PBS series was done about Claudius, I, Claudius. Uh, he was emperor from 41 to 54. That gets us to where we are with 1 Peter. The emperor, when 1 Peter is written, is Nero. Now, what does the name Nero trigger to you? Cruel, um, decadent, uh, everything that, that, we associate, uh, that we associate with what we might call the depravity of, of Rome uh, sort of comes to a focus in Nero. Um, Nero is um, the adopted son of Claudius. Uh, the, the history of Roman emperors is, is fascinating enough to me that I'd spend too much time here. I don't want to do that. But Claudius killed his third wife. And Agrippina sort of maneuvered her way into his life because she had this teenage boy, Nero, that she had high hopes for. So she semi-seduces Claudius, Claudius marries her, adopts Nero. And after a few years, Agrippina, who was a, a scheming, manipulative woman, she fed Claudius some poison mushrooms. And a pretty well-attested fact of history, she offed her husband, Claudius, so that her son and Claudius' adopted heir, Nero, could be emperor. Well, Nero is just a boy at that point, and the first four or five years of his rule were um, fairly uneventful. But, but when he gets mature enough to realize how much power he has as an emperor, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Nero falls into the excesses that we know him for in history. 
Nero fancied himself a great poet and a musician. Uh, he would fill the, the circus in Rome and have people listen to him play the lyre and sing. And of course, they would applaud. No, no voice was ever, for, ever so beautiful. You had the voice of a god. Um, he didn't. Um, Nero uh, was, was a real rascal. Nero gets into our biblical story because of a fire in Rome in July of AD 64. We don't know what started the fire. Uh, Rome in AD 60 was a crowded, uh, narrow streets, houses and, and living apartments stacked on top of each other. Poor construction, wood, flammable. And when the fire started, it just, the people thought it was never going to end. It burned for six days. And uh, at least half and one uh, rather contemporary historian says two thirds of the population of Rome uh, was left homeless by the fire. Another Roman historian of the time says of the 14 districts of Rome, only four were untouched by the fire. So that, I'm just trying to give you a picture of how devastating it was. It was a devastating fire, lots of lives lost, a lot of people homeless. And any of you ever heard fiddling, Nero's fiddling while Rome burned? Nero didn't fiddle while Rome burned. Uh, number one, there was no such thing as a fiddle for another thousand plus years. He played the lyre. Well, he wasn't playing the lyre while Rome burned either. He was 35 miles out of town when the fire started. Now, could he have had the fire set? Yeah, but that's, that's not the evidence that we have of history. Uh, whatever else Nero was, he, he, he wasn't a, a pyromaniac as best we can tell. In fact, when they got word to Nero that Rome was a fire and, and, and central areas of the city were burning and people were being killed, Nero left his place in the country, got back as quickly as he could, and by all accounts actually got out, the, out in the streets and helped fight the fire. It burned for six days. Uh, that They didn't have pumper machines. They, they didn't have a good fire department. And it, it burned for six days, and they thought they had it squelched, and two or three days later, it fired back up again and burned for another three days. Well, it was such a devastating fire that as we probably would today, everybody wants to know what caused it and who's responsible. Guess who they blamed? Nero. Nero. They blamed Nero. Because by that time, this is AD 64, and he became emperor in 54. He is so corrupt. He is so notorious for um, raising taxes. He built him a golden palace. Uh, that we, uh, some of that was unearthed within the last few years. Uh, beautiful mosaics on the floor and the walls and whatever. Uh, he called it the Golden Palace, but, but he was just so corrupt. Um, the people started blaming Nero. In particular, the fire appears to have started in, it was a slum area of the town, but Nero had, had already designed uh, what he called the Golden Mile, an, an area with marble streets and marble columns that was going to give him access to his Golden Palace. And since it started in that area, people said, yeah, that rascal Nero burned it down so he could have it and look the havoc it did to the city. Again, best evidence, Nero didn't do it. Of all the bad things he did, he shouldn't be blamed for that one. Well, Nero, in order to divert suspicion, needed a scapegoat. Guess who he chose? Christians. Um, I'm going to turn around to my shelf and, and read you um, from the Annals of Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus is writing um, 125, maybe 120, 125, second century. And Annals, he's writing the annual history of major events in Rome. Well, he tells about the fire of AD 64, and this is what he writes. All human efforts 
all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the Roman gods did not banish the sinister belief that the fire was the result of the emperor's own order. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class of people hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Now remember, I'm reading you material that was written in the early second century. This is not 20, 21st century historian writing. This is Tacitus writing in the early second century. Notice what he says. He fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, which is a Latin spelling of, of Christ, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators named Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for a moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of anyone who pleaded guilty to being a Christian. Then upon their information, an immense multitude of people were convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, but for their hatred of mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished. Some were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burned to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. I'm almost through reading, but I, I find this fascinating. Nero offered his own gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer and stood aloft on a chariot. Hence, even for criminals who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. Now, that is in a very real way our best extra biblical nest in which to put the eggs of first Peter to crack them open and understand what's going on. We are not sure whether Peter is in Rome on the eve of that persecution under Nero or whether he has already witnessed the beginning of the suffering and, and the persecution that Nero is, is heaping against Christians. If I had my guess, I'm going to say it's probably in the very early days of the persecution, which puts it in, you know, August, September, October, the latter part of the year of AD 64. Could have been just before, but it, it's, it's right at that pivot point where the fire occurs and Nero is being blamed and he names the Christians as scapegoats. Now, from what I read a minute ago, Christians are hated for their abominations, Tacitus says. Now, remember, this is over in the early second century, but, but these are things already that Nero is attributing to Christians. Why do you think the Christians were hated, and what were the abominations they were accused of? Anybody want to jump in and name? Cannibalism. Where in the world would the charge of cannibalism come against Christians? Don't we eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God? Well, every good lie needs what to be believable? A little truth. Just an inkling of truth. Christians did not come together and um, out of some cabal murder people or, or torture and kill babies and eat flesh and drink blood in honor of their Jesus. They came together and ate bread and wine, commemorating 
the body and the blood of Jesus given for them. But the rumor is circulated quite viciously. Those Christians are cannibals. They eat flesh and drink blood. You know another of the rumors? They're incestuous. They call one another brothers and sisters, and they greet with a holy kiss, they call it. So Christians, most of them are from the lower classes, remember. They meet either early in the morning or late at night. They can't, they can't take Sunday off. Sunday wasn't, wasn't a shutdown day for, for Rome. They meet in the early morning. Um, uh, Pliny describes Christian worship over in the second century and says they're in the habit of meeting before dawn uh, to worship. So Christians meet under the cover of darkness, the rumor goes. They call each other brothers and sisters, and then when they meet, they kiss each other. Well, there's another one. They're cannibals. They're incestuous. They're, you know, they, they meet and have orgies. They're, they're, they're just a terrible crowd. And um, another one? I'll come back. So what's the plan? What's the future? We want to hear from the candidates tonight. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Can we get ready for tonight? If somebody's asking a question, you're far enough away from your microphone, I can't hear you. Okay, maybe it was background noise. I'm sorry. Um, if, if, if you want to try again, uh, get a little closer to your microphone. I, I don't want to discourage your contributing. Uh, that's, the one, that's one of the things I miss about a class in a room. I could say, what do you think about? Tell me what. Would you read this verse? Would you open to? Okay. Here's another one. Christians are all atheists. Make sense of that one for me, somebody. What does Paul say? To the pagans, there are gods many and lords many, but to us, there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. The Romans were, of course, polytheistic. Every Roman family worshipped multiple gods. They had a god of the hearth. Almost every home had a little... Um, um, God of the hearth, Vesta, that they, that they worship to try to keep the house uh, safe and, and everybody healthy. Uh, there'd have been a big sale on those during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, they had a, a goddess of fertility. Uh, if they wanted more children, they'd have a fertility goddess in the house, and they'd lay out little sacrifices and say prayers to that one. They had a God for the for the children, they had a God for the crops, they had a God for the weather. They, and then, of course, the state had its gods. And the emperors weren't quite yet claiming to be gods in their lifetimes. But any time a Roman emperor died past Augustus and going forward, first thing the Senate did, they met and didn't lower the flags to half staff. They declared the deceased emperor a god. He has joined the gods, and it became legitimate then to pray to Augustus or to Tiberius or to Caligula or Claudius as the divine Augustus or the divine Tiberius. And we actually have coins uh, from second and third century Roman coins that um, the emperor, perhaps Tiberius, is named Divi Claudia. Uh, the divine Claudius. Uh, so the coin pays tribute to the deceased emperor and, and picks up on the Senate's declaration of him as a god. Okay, Christians are called atheists not because they worship Jesus, but because they don't worship the gods of the hearth and the gods of fertility and the gods of the field and the gods of the sun and, and, and the, the other polytheistic gods that the Romans were famous for. Um, and then, of course, th this, this was the trump card that would be played against many of them, probably under Nero, that were going to be sentenced to death. They're all guilty of treason. What was the charge that got Jesus killed? Blasphemy couldn't get him killed because the, the Romans didn't care if you cursed at a god or two. They had plenty left. 
And so when he was brought and, and, you know, he was accused of the Sanhedrin, well, he said things about the temple and about our God that we think are blasphemous. Pilate was ready to dismiss that. So what, what charge actually got Jesus crucified? Treason. And Jesus tried to explain to Pilate, are you a king? And Jesus' answer came back, what? Yeah, but not like you're thinking about. Uh, my kingdom's not of this world. Uh, I'm, I'm no threat to Caesar. And yet, as it turns out, after the church is established, and especially when you get into the second and the third century, when the persecution is incredibly intense, the great dividing line between literally who will live and who will die is, will you come to an altar of a, a Roman emperor and declare Caesar is Lord? Well, of course, Christians wouldn't. Quoting Paul again, to the pagans, there may be lords many and gods many, but to us Christians, there's one God and one Lord, and that Lord is Jesus Christ. And so beginning probably with Domitian, and this is background to the study of the book of Revelation, because Christians would not say that Domitian is Lord and God, a lot of Christians become martyrs under Domitian, but it really gets intense over in the third century, just past the 250s, when Decius is the emperor, and he, for the first time, makes it a law throughout the empire. In order to be considered a loyal citizen of the empire, you have to go to a temple where at least one of the emperors is worshiped and preferably in Decius' case, me, and you have to put incense on the altar and you have to say, Caesar is Lord. A lot of Christians died because they would not say, Caesar is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Now, go back to First Peter. We are not in the third century. There is not widespread martyrdom. There is not official empire-wide persecution. But you have in 1 Peter the beginning of persecution against Christians under the infamous Nero because Christians are atheists. They won't worship our gods. They're cannibals. They eat flesh and drink blood. They're incestuous. They, they meet and under darkness and call each other brother and sister and they, they kiss and carry on and you know where that's going to go. Next thing you know, they'll be dancing. Um, and you know, they're, they're <laughs> okay. If your background is very conservative, you got that one. Um, but so Ruben, are you saying that the uh, culture of contempt that we're experiencing today in America, where you destroy your opposition really began back in, uh, in under Nero? Are you going to the end with me already, Roy? Hey, it's nothing new, right? <laughs> there, there are very few new things under the sun. And, uh, and in, in, the, in the days of Nero, um, I think the persecution was less. You're going to be put in jail or you're going to be possibly crucified or burned at the stake. I think the persecution is mostly just these rumors and these slanders and these false charges and the general, um, I would just say, rumor mill that Nero builds on and exacerbates and feeds by saying, yeah, there was a terrible fire, and if you want to know where it started from, these Christians who are atheists, they're incestuous, they're flesh eaters, can't, they say the world is going to end in fire. They tried to bring it on by torching the city of Rome. So, yeah, um, political spin is not unique to America. And the use of centralized power, in this case, the voice of the emperor in the arena and the circus, the public games, when he is determined to destroy an opponent, or in this case, a group of people that he, he finds detestable. 
Um, and by the way, in an, another writer, Suetonius, says one of the general things that was said about Christians is they are haters of mankind. Now, I know where that one came from. And it comes, I think it's answered in First Peter. We're going to get to it in a minute. I might paraphrase that section, they're haters of mankind. Christians don't know how to party. If you know anything about Roman life in the imperial city, the emperor very often tried to make friends and influence people with extravagant uh, shows in the circus. Now, now the big Roman Colosseum, uh, you know, that you visit today, that didn't exist in Nero's day. That, that's, that's 150 years or so away. But, but he had a, a smaller venue. It was just called the Circus Maximus. It was it's just a smaller version of, of what later would be built, and that we have the ruins of it today as the Colosseum. He, he would pack thousands of people in, and then there would be uh, maybe in the more innocent days on a, on a festival, the exhibition of exotic animals brought in from some of the areas that the Romans now had under their uh, military boot. Uh, and they might show a giraffe. And in fact, we, we actually have mosaics and bas reliefs of some of the things that were displayed during the days of, of, of uh, Claudius and Nero and, and subsequent emperors. Giraffes. Uh, were popular. Elephants were popular. Um, alligators and crocodiles, the, the kinds of things that, you know, Rome just doesn't have. But, but some of the really blood sport that Nero began to foster. Nero was one of the ones who really enjoyed having gladiatorial combats. And Nero would be one of those that at the end of having Roy and me fight, you know, to the death and Roy's got me on the ground and the sword to my neck, he'd look up to the emperor to say, well, does he live or does he die? And just depending on the whim of Nero, if he thought I had fought valiantly, he might say, I'll let him live. And, and by the way, I think it was the opposite. You know, we thumbs up, let him live, thumbs down, thumbs down let him die. In my two years of Latin that I did back in high school, my teacher said, actually, in Rome, thumbs down meant that you get to live, and thumbs up meant go ahead and kill him. Uh, so I, I can't speak to that with authority. But, but, but Nero uh, liked blood sport, and he would send slaves to fight a tiger, or he would send slaves to, you know, wrestle a crocodile. And in the most brutal forms, he'd send this slave to fight that slave or this group of three to fight that group of three. It was sort of like, you know, wrestling on steroids because at the end of it, it wasn't just that somebody would get the belt. Somebody would probably get his head chopped off. And, and the persecution under Nero becomes so horrible that Paul and Peter both in Rome about that time. Paul coming back, you know, the, the book of Acts closes and Paul is under house arrest in Rome. That's, that's the spring of AD 62. Paul is released and, you know, from Romans, you know, I, I want to go visit, uh, or from, uh, I want to go into Spain. Uh, maybe he did, tradition says he did. He comes back in, in 64-ish, about that time, Peter arrives there. And, and when the persecution begins under Nero, both Paul and Peter are put under arrest. Now, the guides will take you to the dungeon where Paul was kept and the dungeon where Peter was kept. I don't know how reliable that is. But uh, Paul was, was beheaded by the best information that we have. And when the time came for Peter to be put to death, Nero was going to have him crucified uh, as a mock image of the way Peter's Lord. Peter, if you won't confess me as Lord, I'll just let you die like your Lord died. I'll, I'll string you up on a cross and let's see how long you can last. Um, the, the information that we have, Peter says, I do not deserve to die the way my Lord did. And he begged them if they were going to crucify him, to crucify him upside down. And again, by, by tradition, Peter did die by crucifixion under Nero uh, in probably 64, 65, crucified upside down. 
because he said, I don't deserve to suffer in a way that would make me look like my Lord. Um, okay, that's the historical setting for First Peter. And I'm picking up my Bible now, and if you have yours handy, I'm hoping by doing some history to have put you back sort of in the mindset of what kind of a world is Peter writing to when he writes this letter and when he calls and, and skip all the way to the end of first Peter, the last two verses of first Peter, she who is in Babylon chosen together with you sends her greetings. So does my son, Mark greet one another with a kiss of love. He wouldn't, not use the term just because it was a rumor term. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The term Babylon here is, is a cryptic way that, that Peter refers to Rome, just as the book of Revelation refers to Rome as Babylon, because to the Jewish mind after the exile in Babylon, Anytime they wanted to say a place is rotten to the core, it is decadent, it is opposed to God, they would, they would call it Babylon. Uh, we still do that today. No, uh, people would say at certain times in American history that Los Angeles is just a West Coast Babylon or New York is just a Babylon of our country. So Babylon becomes for Peter a, a cryptic way of identifying where he is in Rome. When first Peter is written, this persecution is either right on the verge of breaking out or, in my opinion, most likely, nobody knows for sure, it has just happened and Peter sees what's coming. And so he writes this letter saying, folks, um, you're going to have to prepare yourself for an ordeal that is about to come on you. And if you think it's bad that they've circulated rumors about us, that they've called us haters of mankind, people that don't know how to party and don't know how to have a good time. If you think it's bad that they, they've said we are incestuous and we're cannibalistic and we're atheists, it's gonna get worse. And some of you are going to pay perhaps even the ultimate price. Now, here, if you've got your Bible handy, turn to 1 Peter 4. We're going to go back to chapter 1, verse 1 in a minute, but turn to 1 Peter 4, and I'll tell you why I think we may have just had the fire in Rome, and, and there may be even be a hint to that. This is 1 Peter 4. I'm beginning at verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. Verse 15, if you suffer, don't let it be as a murderer or a thief, whatever, Verse 16, but if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. So I think my clue is all the way back in verse 12. Don't be surprised at what? This ordeal of fire. Now, depending on the translation that you're reading, I'm reading the NIV. It, it uses the word fire here as an adjective. Uh, don't be shocked by the fiery ordeal. Uh, depending on your translation, it may be called um, the, the ordeal that is coming by fire. Uh, I, I, if Peter uses Babylon as a sort of a code word, cryptic word for the imperial city, the decadent city of Rome, I think here he may be using this fiery ordeal, this ordeal by fire to name what has set in motion, what he says is going to get incredibly worse before it even begins to think about getting better. So Christians, brace yourself. And I'm going to show you in a minute that in this narrative of suffering, 
Peter basically is going to say this. Um, we should expect to suffer if we follow Christ, because look what they did to him. Um, Christian apologists in the second century used to compare Jesus and Socrates. Um, do, do you know the story of Socrates in ancient Athens? They put him to death for atheism. Well, Socrates was called an atheist for the same reason Christians were called an atheist. He said, I believe in God. I just don't believe in the gods that Homer and Hesiod tell about because they stab each other in the back and they rape each other's wives and daughters and they lie and they steal. And he said, anybody worthy of worship wouldn't do that. In fact, anybody who tells those stories about the gods, we ought to bar from Athens. Well, when Socrates, as an old man in his early 70s, 70, 70, 71 years old, when he is hauled up before the, the city tribunal, the public forum, and eventually sentenced to death, they, they charge him with two things, atheism and corrupting the young people. Well, he's accused of atheism because he says the gods that Athens has been worshiping aren't, aren't really gods. Uh, no god worth his salt would do the things that you say to God. If, if he's God, he's holy. And number two, corrupting the youth. Yeah, he was telling his students what he believed about the kind of city Athens should be and, and that you've been told horrible things and, and no God would do those. So he's an atheist and through his atheism, he's corrupting our young people. Well, I, I think they were gonna find Socrates and Socrates poked them in the eye. And when he had a chance to say, um, a Greek trial was in two phases, just like an American trial is. The first is guilt or innocence. Is Socrates guilty? Well, the first phase of the trial ends, he's guilty. And then both the prosecution and Socrates for the defense gets to propose a punishment. And um, Socrates proposes the following punishment. I think I should be honored and my meals brought to me in the town square every day at high noon. Uh, well, from that, he made everybody mad. And the prosecutor got up and said, any fool who'd say something like this when he's been found guilty is in, insulting the honor of the city. We ought to kill him. Well, they had to choose one or the other. And by a narrow vote, a swing of only about a dozen votes, um, the, the jury, which is about 600 citizens, they condemn him to die. Well, Mar uh, Christian apologists in the second century said Socrates and Jesus are so much alike. They were good men. They were moral. They were challenging the unethical behavior of the citizens and challenging false notions of God. In fact, um, apologists like Justin Martyr said Socrates and Plato were prophets to the Greeks, just like Moses and Jesus were prophets to the Jews. Now, I, I think that overstates the case by a large amount, but, but I understand why the Socrates and Jesus stories were held in parallel, because you had two people who, loving Athens, loving Jerusalem, loving their fellow Greeks, loving the Jewish people to whom he was presenting himself as Messiah, even though they loved their cities and loved their people. But they were, they were calling on their people to repent, and repentance is a hard and unpleasant thing. So Peter is writing in the historical context I've described. Nero is the emperor, wicked, cruel, uh, loves blood sport. There has probably, and for our purposes, I'm going to say, there has just been this big fire in Rome, and he is saying, me? I'm your beloved emperor. I didn't cause this. Christians did. We know they're terrible people, and if you didn't know their eschatology, they say the world's going to end in fire. They tried to bring their Jesus back. They said that when the world ends, he's coming back. They set the capital of the world on fire, hoping to see if there was anything to this Jesus coming back stuff. Well, the persecution start, and in 1 Peter 4.12, I think Peter is hinting at it when he says, this fiery ordeal um, is upon us, and if you are going to suffer, and many of us are, 
don't let it be for anything bad you have done. Don't suffer because you have told a lie or you've stolen something from your master or because you've, you know, retaliated against somebody's attempt to harm you. And, and he's going to talk about that in detail. If you suffer, make sure it's because you're suffering as a Christian. You are maintaining your integrity as a disciple. You are saying, yes, I believe there is a Lord, but I can't confess that it's Caesar. I confess that it's Jesus. And, and if they say, you don't know how to party and have a good time, uh, say, well, and he will say this in a minute. I used to run to those parties and I used to get drunk and I, I used to do this and that. And, and I used to squirrel stuff out of my master's bank account or out of the, but now that I'm a Christian, I quit doing that. So no, I don't, I don't hate the human race and, and I don't know how to party and have fun. I just think there is a joy in imitating the righteousness of Christ that's greater than the kind of fun you think you have at your drunken parties and your orgies. Okay, that takes us to the text. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm in chapter 1, verse 1, you might have guessed, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who had been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Two quick things. Notice the Trinitarian form of Peter's theology. Uh, verse 2, you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Peter's Trinitarian to the core. He is a monotheistic Jew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is God alone. He's a monotheist, but his monotheism is not challenged with the fact that he sees the one Christian God uh, existing as three separate personalities, God the Father, uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And these people that God has foreknown and chosen, look at the terms that are used of them. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces. Now, those provinces that he names, that's basically modern-day Turkey. Um, so uh, Peter is writing to a, a geographical area where he knows what they're beginning to experience in Rome is going to spread, and he calls them God's elect exiles scattered. Some of them already have fled Rome for that area. And then skip all the way down to verse 2, who had been chosen you got two words here, God's elect, chosen people. That's Jewish language. Uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. Paul says, yeah, but now that Christ has come, the Messiah, uh, we're all the children of Abraham by faith in Christ. And whether Jew or Gentile by birth, we're God's chosen people collectively Jews and Gentiles who've come to Christ. And Paul in what Galatians 6, 16 calls the church God's new Israel, not to displace um, the descendants of Abraham, but to enlarge and expand. Okay, here's my question. How are they God's elect and chosen if at the same time they're exiles? Doesn't that sound a little bit like a double negative in English grammar? Uh, that, that one of them sort of rules out the other. Well, if we're God's chosen and elect people, how could we be exiles? We are being so hounded and persecuted that some of us have already fled the capital city. Peter's writing this letter, and, and of course there are others still in Rome having to face it. If we're God's elect, why are we suffering? Um, I've had lots of church people ask me that question just about personal tragedies in their lives. Um, but I'm a Christian. Uh, I go to church. Uh, I tithe. I love my neighbor. I, I, I'm faithful to my wife. I'm good to my children. Um, why did I have a heart attack? 
um, why, um, why has my child acted out uh, and is now hooked on drugs or why is she pregnant? How could this happen to me? My point at the beginning of the letter, Peter is making the point subtly that he will now begin to make overtly. Look, the fact that you're a Christian doesn't mean you're exempt from trouble. The fact that you are numbered among God's elect and chosen people doesn't mean that everybody's going to like you. The fact that you are God's, among God's chosen doesn't mean that you might not have to suffer. And ironically, the suffering may be just as it was for the Jews of antiquity. Um, they were enslaved in Egypt and they were taken off into Babylon because they were God's chosen people. So to be elect and chosen and to be in exile, to be a Christian and still to suffer, Peter says, don't let that shock you. Uh, sometimes you suffer precisely because you are a Christian. What's Jesus say in the Beatitudes? Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness. Sense. Um, so, they are, they're God's chosen people, but to the world, they are exiles. And again, this is Jewish language. Uh, when Abraham is called and given the promise, I'll make your descendants great, give you a land and, and bless all nations through you. He starts traveling. How soon does he get a homestead and a nice house in Palestine? He never does. The Old Testament and New continue to make the point. He was a stranger and an exile for the rest of his life. And the land was not given to his descendants until multiple generations later. Peter says, well, you, you, the fact that you're suffering doesn't mean that you're not God's chosen. It doesn't mean that you're not a child of Abraham. It doesn't mean that you're not a person of faith. So he, he does this suffering narrative. Look down in chapter 1, verse 6. Ruba? Yeah. Ruba, can I bring, interrupt you and ask a question? Sure. Where do you think so many would-be Christians get this idea that because they're Christians, they believe that, that nothing bad's going to happen to them? Well, I get it because I'm just... Joel selfish. Osteen. Huh? Joel Osteen. Yeah, Joel Osteen, exactly. I mean, the, the, the health and wealth theology is not a new phenomenon. It's always been around. Um, what did Job's three friends say when they came to him, when all this tragedy had come down on his head? We know that bad things don't happen to good people. So Job, we thought you were a good and decent man. If you'll confess your sin, maybe God will relieve you from what, from your illness. So the, the assumption tends to be, if I'm a good and decent person, nothing bad should happen to me. Job's friends assumed that. Jesus' disciples assumed that. John chapter 9, they're walking into Jericho. They pass a blind man. And what do the disciples, with the great compassion that pours out of their heart, ask Jesus? Who's in, this man or his parents, that he's born blind and in the mess he's in? Their notion is bad things happen to you. Eastern religions, not Judaism and not Christianity, call it karma, Right. My bad karma is coming down on me. I did something bad down there, and it's, it's boomeranging and coming down on me. The book of Job is in the Bible to say that's not true. Sometimes, like Job, you're suffering because you are a godly man, and Satan is trying to break you. In the case of the blind man, Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But while we're here, let's do something to help him because while it's day, because the night's going to come and, you know, we won't, we won't be in town. And, and we, so the, the health and wealth theology, I think, is sort of natural to us. I'm just selfish enough that I don't want anything unpleasant in my life. And I am self-protective enough that, that if something bad happens and I, I have a bad illness or, you know, my business goes belly up or, or, or my kid has a car wreck. What's the first thing we have? What did I do to deserve this? Truth of the matter is most of what happens in this world is random. Jesus says it rains on the just and the unjust. Sun shines on good people and bad people. 
Faith is not an insurance policy against trouble. Faith is the relationship with God that lets you deal with and get through your troubles. And if I go back to the personality of Peter, the orientation, disorientation, and reorientation, I, I can take that as a rubric, not just for Peter's life, but mine. Orientation, today I'm healthy and life is good. If tomorrow I get really sick with COVID-19, um, what did I do to deserve this? I am now disoriented. Um, hopefully, if I live and get through it, I say, well, you know, I, 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 I'm, I've learned some things. At least I can be more compassionate to other people who get it now that I've seen how bad it is. Doesn't always work, but that might be. So where does it come from? I think it comes from our selfishness. But it's old, old theology that's been around for a long time. And Peter knows that the people he's writing to, they are going to be flummoxed. That's a technical word, right? He knows they're going, be, they're, they're going to be flummoxed by the fact that, wait a minute, we were convinced by Peter's preaching or Paul's preaching or our neighbors telling us the, the story of Jesus that, that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. We have cast our lot with him. We have confessed our faith in him. Uh, we worship him. How could this be happening to us? So um, chosen exile or elect sufferer is not a grammatical double negative or an oxymoron. Uh, so look, look at the suffering words that are used in, in the text. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, you, you say, well, really, you're skipping the positive part here that he's rejoiced in. Yeah, that's what we're going to look at next week. This week is the suffering narrative. And then uh, next week, we're going to go back and say, and this is what Peter tells Christians that's going to anchor them through the hard times. And that is, your faith is a true faith, and what it is giving you title to is worth anything you have to endure in the meanwhile. So there's the first reference in verse 6. You're going to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And now look down at verse 11. Um, chapter 1 and verse 11, trying to find out what time and circumstances that the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing to when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Ooh, big hint right there for what we'll get into next week. Okay, if, if they've been listening to Joel Osteen, on, on, you know, the, the Imperial City Channel 4, and they'd heard the health and wealth gospel preached, and they're suffering and confused. First thing Peter is saying to them back in verse 6, you shouldn't be shocked. Uh, and, and, and you're going to get through it. This is for a little while. But now in verse 11, he says, now remember the story of Jesus on which you've based your faith. Didn't he suffer? If righteousness exempts you from suffering, forget Job and forget the blind man in John 9. They may have been good guys who hadn't done anything to, quote, deserve their problem. But what about Jesus? He's the perfect Lamb of God. He's without spot or blemish. Did he suffer? Well, yeah. I think Peter's point that he's making here is suffering sort of goes with righteousness. Jesus actually told people, Look, in this world, um, they're going to hate you because they've hated me and you're my disciples. So whatever there was about Jesus that triggered unhappiness to the point that he made enemies is going to make some people unhappy and they'll consider themselves our enemies if we follow him very closely. Now, if I accommodate close enough to the world, you know, why shouldn't anybody criticize me and give me, give me grief? But Peter says, the closer you walk with Jesus, the more of this you're going to experience. Look in chapter 2, 
And, and this time we're going to begin reading at verse 19, and I'm going to read for a few times. And you're going to hear suffering and suffer, uh, I think, three times in a total of this. Chapter 2, beginning at 19. It is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure that? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Ooh, important set of insights there. Not only, he repeats, do we follow the perfect Lamb of God who suffered himself, but all of us know that sometimes we bring suffering on ourselves. He said, there's no, there's no virtue in taking a beating or some other punishment if you've done something criminal or immoral and you get caught. But he said, if you suffer for doing good, this is the middle part of verse 20, if you suffer for doing good and endure that, ah, that's a virtue. That's commendable before God. Now look at chapter 3. We're picking up the suffering narrative. Look first at verse 14. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Um, boy, that's strange language, but do you remember in Acts 4 when the apostles were hauled before the Sanhedrin and charged, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore, and they did it anyway, and they hauled them back in, and this time they said, okay, you didn't learn your lesson, and they, they gave them a beating. You remember what the text says that as they left the council, they were rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. So Peter is telling them, Jesus suffered, you may suffer. If you do suffer, let it be not justly because you've done something criminal or bad, but if you suffer, let it be for doing right. And when you do, you're blessed. Uh, you, you, have, you have the blessing of God that you were willing to maintain your integrity in the face of a threat. Verse 17, still in chapter three, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil. Next verse, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Now, body and spirit here is means the same thing it does in Paul. It doesn't mean your inner and your outer self. You're put to death in the body. That is, in the sphere of things that are this world, but then in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was given back to life. You have the same spirit in you. And even if you should have to die for your faith, the resurrection lies ahead. Uh, you are not going to lose out. Quickly, chapter four, and then we're, we're about to, we got about three minutes by my clock. Chapter four, verse one, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. If you suffer in this world and in your physical body, in, in the in the realm that's dominated by, by this world and its power. He says, um, just have the same attitude Jesus had. Well, I would expect righteousness to get me in trouble. And then beginning in chapter four, beginning at 12, this is, this is really a, a deep text. We've already started reading the first verse. The word suffering appears four different times in this text. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but, in, but rejoice in as much as you participate, you participate in. The suffering they were going to endure, it, it's going to be counted as you're suffering the very wounds of Christ. 
inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Share in his sufferings, you're going to share in his exaltation. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler, gossip. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who don't obey the gospel of God? There's part of his looking ahead, too. Look, one day this, this fruitcake gets turned upside down. Right now, the world and the flesh has all the power. Nero and the people of, of God, people of the Spirit, they're suffering and being persecuted. When Jesus comes back and judgment starts, boy, that cake gets flipped. Righteousness is vindicated, and the people who have been perverse and wicked uh, like Nero to oppose God, uh, they get their comeuppance. Verse 18, and if it's hard for the righteous to be saved in that day of judgment, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will, those of you who suffer because you're Christians, should commit yourselves to your faithful creator and continue to do good. I'm going to close with that verse in just a minute. And then finally, in chapter 5, verse 1, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness to Christ's suffering. Suffering is again mentioned. Then in verses 9 and 10, resist the devil, stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and steadfast. Okay. Tonight's study of First Peter is the suffering narrative. What was the context to which it was written? Nero, his blaming the fire, persecuting the Christians. What's Peter's message? Suffering shouldn't surprise us. Jesus suffered and we're his followers. Jesus said, if the world hated me, trust me, they're going to hate you because they hated me, not because I was a bad person, but because I lived in righteousness. And if you follow me in righteousness, they're going to treat you the same way. So these exhortations, stand firm, don't suffer because you deserve it for doing wrong. If you suffer, let it be as a Christian. If you suffer, let it be because you're living God's will and you're doing good. Um, and I said I was going to close by going back to this verse. What's, what is the core word that Peter gives to these people about how to handle suffering? Chapter 4, verse 19. Those who suffer according to God's will, and according to God's will doesn't mean God picked you out to suffer but not me. It, it's if you are suffering because you're living God's will, because, because you are pursuing the will of God in a world that's dominated by the flesh. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I heard an old preacher tell this story years ago, and I've never forgotten it. He, he lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he went to the home of a family where the mother of this family had just died of cancer. So her husband was left a widow with a four-year-old little girl. And so he goes into the home, okay, I can talk to the husband and the father, and I can say, I'm so sorry, I'm here for you, can I help with the funeral? But what do you say to a four-year-old? And so as he told the story, he said, I got down on my knees so I could just be at eye level with her. So my heart was breaking and I, I just was fighting, breaking out into tears. And I said, I don't remember the little girl's name. I said, sweetie, I'm so sorry about your mommy's death. What are you going to do? What a, what a question to ask for you. What are you going to do? And she looked up at him and said, Boy, the Bob, I guess I just don't keep on doing the tundy to with her lip quivering. Brother Bob, I guess I'm just going to keep on going to Sunday school. I think that's 
in child's language, the message of First Peter. Guys, you know who Nero is. You know what we're facing. Yes, it's bad, all the rumors. It's going to get worse. This fiery ordeal that has come is going to test everything that's in us. So we're going to suffer, but don't let it be because we've struck back, we've retaliated, and we, we, let's be the best people. Let's just keep on going to Sunday school, trust ourselves to God, and believe that at the end, God will make whatever we have to endure for his sake worthwhile. Well, that's next week. What is the reward narrative that Peter lays out to these people? And what does he say comes, number one, to sustain them in their ordeal, and number two, that's going to make it worthwhile for them to maintain faith even in the darkest hour?